everybody. This is Marianne Mohenraj and Ben Rosenbaum here with the Speculative Literature Foundation's podcast, Mohenraj and Rosenbaum are humans. We're here today. Or so we claim. <laughs> yeah. We're here today with uh, a guest, Fred Berman, who I actually don't know what your title is, Fred. Fred um, was sir. the... <laughs> sir. Sir, <laughs> sir. Sir was the uh, audio book recorder for Ben Rosenbaum's new novel, The Unraveling. Um, which you should nominate for all the awards now that we're entering award season. So I'll just mention that here, the Hugo, the Nebula, the Tip Tree, uh, the Dragon. The, and the Audis. The Audis. Which Audis. Fred, has already, Fred has already won a couple, I think. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so really delighted to have you here, Fred. And I don't know whether Ben can do, we actually did not like prep a formal intro. So, um, well, I, I, I just wanted to say, uh, kind of the premise that you and I had talked about for this was we, we were like, you know, one thing we do on the, I was saying this before the show, one thing we do, we, we, we see this podcast is doing is educating people who are interested in the writing life and starting as writers or whatever um, about different aspects of the industry and sort of it occurred to us you know we have a test case here in that this book is this novel of mine just came out so all the different and we've already interviewed the editor uh, and publisher uh, Liz uh, Gorinsky and and so on so so we and you know, we sort of had a, a critical overview of talking about the book and 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 but there's a lot of people involved um, in making the book and so since the, the audio book is coming out shortly January 25th um, I don't know if this is going to air before then or not, but but we uh, we I thought it would be a cool idea to talk to Fred, who narrated it, about what that part of the the the, the, the process is like, how you go from a, a text to an audiobook. Um, so that's you know, and and just also to hear about that side of the of the industry and like what it's like. How do you how do you get involved in that and 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 so on. Sure, I want to listen to the one with your editor because just how they with all the pronouns. Yeah, I mean, that must have been amazing to go. I yeah, mean, I don't know how you wrote that, let alone just to keep, how you were able to keep that straight well, in your head. You know, so the, I, I mean, man, I've the told the story before, but for them. <laughs> well, here's the thing that's funny about that. I've told the story before, but I'll mention it again briefly since you since you bring it up is I I wrote it took me like 10 years to write this book. Like it was a it, you know, it was a, it was a long I mean, it was a bit of an on again, off again project. But, you know, basically most of 10 years or, or so, maybe more from original conception, maybe more. Uh, and, uh, and and back then, when I was first conceiving it, I didn't think anybody would. I mean, I knew that these weren't men and women in the book, mm. that there were people of two different genders and I'd invented these genders and they had different social constraints, but I didn't figure I could get away with neo pronouns at the time. So I just wow. uh, randomly assigned he to one and she to the other. But then as I got critique and got, I realized people, you can't get away from, like as soon as you, so even if you tell everyone this is arbitrary, there's not, they, they immediately think of one as it's very hard for us not to think of yeah. to divide everything in the world into men and women. So so um, so uh, I started internally for me using neo pronouns in the document. But then I because I'm a programmer on the side then I would run a compile script that would turn it into a he she version and, she, and a she he version. And I would read them both to keep myself honest. So uh -huh. I didn't know which one I was going to use. But I was like, well, sort of you know, like uh, um, Schrodinger's gender. I don't know. I was like, maybe I'll release both. You could read either. You know what I mean? But I, I just figured people would stumble over them or it would be hard. And it was actually Liz, it was actually my editor, Liz Grinsky, who who kind of pushed me to have the courage of my convictions. She was like, you don't, you really want, you really want these to be different genders. And so she was actually like, just go for it. Like use, use uh, these neo pronouns. And I experimented with a lot of different kinds and the one other hurdle was the ones i ended up using are real pronouns that some people use so i was a little like am i appropriating these pronouns um but i you know i i partly consoled myself with the idea that i'm not um just using them arbitrarily i'm i'm ex it's science fiction i'm extrapolating that perhaps they survive or some version of them through many iterations oh, yeah. there. but no. these are so it, they, uh, it, it, it takes a while it took my brain a while yeah to you know, even when when I first got the audition material and then yeah. even in reading it, but then you, I mean, it's like reading A Clockwork Orange or trans, you know, yeah. train spotting, a book like that, where in the beginning, yeah, like, yeah. you keep going back to the glossary. Right. Um, and then <laughs> eventually it just, you, you know, it, it, you, it, it just by osmosis, it becomes a part of your vocabulary. Which yeah. Which is sort of what I think, you know, that that's the hope for people who do use these different pronouns that that is mm -hmm. that we're going to eventually get there. You know, that mm -hmm, it shouldn't mm -hmm. be that strange, you know, to divert from just a he or she, 
You know, I'm yeah. still wrapping my brain around, you know, they and them with certain friends of mine. And but like eventually yeah. it'll just be we'll just get used to it. So which is exactly yeah. what happened in, in reading your book. Which yeah, is fantastic, it's part, by the way. I'm going to I'm going to interrupt here because as, as much uh -huh. as I love that we're getting into the nitty gritty of this, we still have an introduction. Yeah. So, okay. um, <laughs> so, so um, I could listen to Ben talk about pronouns all day long. But <laughs> yeah, but good I, point. Good point. I, I think, Fred, I would love um, if you could introduce yourself, but if you can kind of weave into that a little bit, just how you got into um, doing audiobook narration, that would be great. I've been told I have a lovely speaking voice. And so every once in a while, I think I could be an audiobook narrator. And then I realize I don't know anything about what the job actually entails. So, <laughs> And I, can't, I also can't act. So anything that involves like making characters and so on is beyond me. But um, so, so yeah, if you could talk about how you ended up doing this and, uh, and you know, get to your awards and so on, that would be great. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I get a lot of calls or I've spoken to a lot of people who are like, so they told me that I have a really nice voice. I'm like, I do. Can you read a book straight for five, you know, can, can you do more than that? Um, yeah. I once had a guy, my, my mother-in-law, rest her soul. She, her, her friend's dentist, I think, or her friend's <laughs> doctor got in touch with me and he's like, I've been told that I have a great voice. He's like, I don't give a shit about acting because I'm a very wealthy doctor, but, uh, <laughs> I, but and, and immediately I'm like, well, you won me over already. I can't wait to sit down and talk. Well, maybe if you typecast him for the right book where the narrator, in fact, is like an arrogant, uh, I you know. guess, but I was like, <laughs> I'm self-reflective. Maybe yeah, maybe I was like, okay, I think we're dead. He, you know, he lost me. At that <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> But uh, yes, my well, how how do I introduce my my name's Fred Berman. Um, I'm an actor. I uh, I'm currently I play Timon in The Lion King on Broadway. I've been doing that for uh, the last ten or so years now. Um, well, yeah. Hopefully that will oh. continue. Uh, you know, it's sort of hit or miss now with theater, but we seem to be knock on wood. We seem to be doing okay. Um, uh, based in New York. I have a lovely wife and two children, and I've been doing audiobooks for, I don't know, for a, a while now. I got into it, you know, I, I had been doing voiceovers, and I, I've always, you know, I did mostly theater, but theater and film and TV, and uh, uh, been doing that for a long time, and then uh, I've been doing voiceovers for a while, and then I auditioned for my first audio book was called The Last Holiday Concert. It's a children's book by Andrew Clements, and I got it, and that sort of started things off. Um, I was lucky because I worked with some wonder... Actually, I just worked... Um, Paula Parker uh, is her name. She directed me in that, and I actually just did a book with her last week, and she started me off, and, and just this group of, of directors and engineers and producers that I worked with were just very kind, and they just kept calling me back and suggesting me for things and um you know just through networking we just very lucky and got to fall into that circle and at the time when I got into it it was it was a tight circle to get into and I considered myself very lucky you know to be able to do that and and I really enjoyed it and I was very lucky that I was being thrown some really good books like there was never you know thankfully there were there were no stinkers to sort of turn uh -huh. off from it uh yeah so yeah, and I've been you know uh, knock on wood consistently working in that world, and uh, it I got I mean with this with the pandemic it really it saved me. We were yeah I was gonna you know, say yeah all of us in this industry were able to to keep working, and I you know mm -hmm. right before I mean I'm, I'm in my booth now. I built a, I have a you know a professionally vetted sound booth now, but in the beginning I just mm -hmm. randomly upgraded my mic and got some good stuff. I just thought, well, I should just have this at home because mm -hmm. I actually always liked going into studios. I don't like, now I enjoy recording at home, but it, I never want to do that because I enjoy the introduction mm -hmm. and, you know, walking into an office as it were. Yeah. But I just happened to randomly, I bought some stuff. I'm like, I should have this if I ever need to do pickups or auditions at home. And then the mm -hmm. shutdown happened. Right. And I was like, oh my God, I have this stuff. And I, I was like, I need a closet. I need a closet. <laughs> I took every comforter and blanket in the well, house. Yeah. That I could find, and I and uh -huh. for that year and a half when my show was shut down and everything was shut down, I was 
very lucky to be consistently working. I mean, my wife and kids couldn't go to the bathroom or walk around mm -hmm. at all. You know, they had to be completely quiet <laughs> right. all day. But uh, it was it was it was great. And actually, I thought, um, you know, when I was doing your book, I had done early in the pandemic. I had done Charlie Kaufman's first novel called Oh, uh -huh. Mind, which is oh if wow. You're, if you're a Charlie Kaufman fan. Highly uh -huh. recommend it. If you're not yeah. a fan, don't go near it because it'll just. <laughs> I, I missed the title. Could you repeat it's it? It's called Ant Kind. Ah, it's thank you. Ant Kind. Least, yeah, it's the craziest thing I've ever read in my entire life. And I actually had to record it twice, which is a whole hmm. other story. It's a thousand pages long. And we had to do it twice. But, um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was, that, that, that's a long, crazy story. And it's well, not, why twice? Just the, what's the, at least the short version. <laughs> well, the, the short version is the, the it's told first person. The main character is this sort of insufferable sort of um, he's he's a, uh, a, a, a film historian slash critic. Um, and it's, it, it's very like, um, I'm blanking on what's the character in Confederacy of Dunces? Uh, the, oh yeah. The, uh, I, I don't the remember name. the guy's it, name, but just yeah. Sort of this an, an insufferable guy who pictures, uh -huh. sees himself as really woke. Uh, uh -huh. and Charlie wanted it, pictured him sort of, uh, read as a certain character, a, uh, mm. in a certain voice. Mm -hmm. and so we did it that way and we recorded the whole thing. And then afterwards mm -hmm. we realized it wasn't right. Mm, yeah it yeah actually doesn't it's interesting but so we we did it again wow. which was as an actor yeah it was actually i was tearing my hair out at first right but it was right. one of the greatest experiences ever to get to revisit wow. something yeah. like that and do it completely different it was really amazing. yeah but that being said he constantly refers to himself as thon that that's his uh -huh. pronoun i see myself as thon, oh okay right it's only because he's right. being he's he's <laughs> it's like he's, he's like I said, he sees himself as really woke, but he's really just uh -huh. a complete idiot and and yeah, completely insufferable. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope, I you, I hope you, got, got, you got paid twice for that, right? I hope like I they did. yes, no, okay. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, that that's good. That made this thing easier. Um, but no, it's brilliant. Um, I don't know how I got on there. Oh, the pronouns and the thons. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, and working sure. During the pandemic, so working. yeah. I'm so I'm so glad yeah. that all of you that so many of you I guess were able to pivot. I swear, is the, I was saying it was the word of the year. I think it's the word of the last two years, but um, I just <laughs> used it in an email yesterday. Sadly, um, <laughs> I'm so glad that you were able to pivot uh, to this. I went to see my first live theater in two 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 years um, over the holidays, and which is probably not a great time to go see it, but I was visiting my relatives uh, near What'd Thanksgiving. You say? Um, it was a, what was the title of it? It was a, it was a medley of older Broadway pieces that they had put together into a performance. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, I'm like now blanking on the name of the theater. It was in Connecticut. Um, we, we drove out there with my mom. Uh, it was sort of Aim towards uh, an audience that would fondly remember Oklahoma. Uh, okay. So yeah. we were, I was one of the, me and my daughter were definitely some of the youngest. The audience. youngest people in that uh, place. But it was actually <laughs> interesting because they, um, they updated it in the sense that like suddenly many of the songs had uh, were gay romances or interracial mm -hmm. romances, et cetera. Um, the actors did a lot. They had, real fun with it. And it went over very well with the audience. I was a little nervous when they first started gender bending it and they were, the audience just went right with them. So mm -hmm. it was really cool. great. And it was great to be, it was, you know, they required everyone to be vaccinated and show their cards and yeah. it was great to, and it was a small theater, um, maybe a couple hundred people, uh, just the energy in the room was so lovely. And uh, I can't, I can't wait. I hope this summer we're, we're all back to that again. So full time, but I hope so. It, it was, it was, very strange coming back but then it was like yeah the the it, it was electric i mean the audience yeah. is people yeah were exploding. yeah now we're back to it's you know it's weird with this omicron now it's right. people are very yeah it's, it's, the audience is a little more tentative and i think everyone's just thinking is this should we be here is this right, <laughs> right. did somebody just cough <laughs> yeah yeah it's a little it's crazy but yeah you know but it but it it, it, it was really amazing once once the show came back up and all the shows, just the, the energy was just unbelievable. Mm, it's that connection, yeah. you know, getting that connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nothing quite like live theater. My uh, my son was in a 
a, a play in the school play and it, it, it got, you know, of course, sort of shut down and postponed and this and that. And they eventually moved it outside. So they had it in a, it was actually in a, it was like, um, it was, it was a bunch of Greek plays stitched together. So it was like Oedipus and Antigone. Um, and he was playing Oedipus and they, they moved it to wow, the backyard. Oh, he's like, he's 18 now. So he's, oh, okay. he's, 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 In my he's head, like a I'm senior. Like, that's, I was thinking it was like elementary school. That's, <laughs> it's like 10 year old to playing you know, Oedipus. Yeah, that'd be pretty stabbing intense. their eyes. No, he was, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think he was I think he was 17 at the time. So yeah, he, he was, uh, oh, they, it was a cool production. He, he had this, the, to stab him his eyes out, he had this giant mask, like this sort of huge paper mache mask with sparklers in it. So like, but they had a remote control. So like he held up, hit the mask in front of his face and then the, you know, it sprayed sparks out of his eyes when he's oh putting God, his eyes. It's like out. an Iron Maiden concert. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was. A, I thought it was a cool solution that they put it outside and they built these. You know, and they did it in the rain part of the time and whatever. Yeah. But, but, uh, but uh, yeah, they had. Yeah, to a lot of theaters solutions. are. A lot of regional theaters are moving to that mode now, where they're trying to. I was just having a conversation with a theater show I'm directing now, and we were talking to a theater mm -hmm. in Ithaca, and they. That's what they did last year. They had to. Yeah. They built an outdoor space, so they yeah. had to do half their. You know, they did all their season there. Uh, yeah. And uh, and now they're you know for the new season, depending on what happens, you know a lot of theaters are like well we'll do half the season outdoors, half indoors. Right. Just have right. An option. Yeah, I mean, sort of like a return to the. It, well, I mean, I thought it was appropriate for Antigone and Oedipus, like a return right. to the ancient amphitheater. You know, it's uh... yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, when we were in went to Worldcon, I don't know if you're a sci-fi person, Fred, but when the science fiction convention it moves around the world and it, the World Science Fiction Convention, it was in London a few years back, and uh, I obviously used the chance to do lots of sightseeing, and I went. I attended a, a Shakespeare play at the Globe. And oh, cool. It was incredible. Yeah. It was just like, you know, you knew you were going to be outside. I'm I'm now, well, I've just turned 50, so I paid the extra couple pounds for a cushioned seat, which I strongly <laughs> recommend. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> otherwise you're sitting on bare boards for two hours. Um, yeah. So you, you get a nice cushion for your, for your butt and your back. And, uh, but I don't know, it was the, the way that the actors were able to integrate the outside world, there was a point at which these these birds just kind of swooped across the stage randomly, <laughs> and the actors just went with they it just and went, yeah. the birds oh, and kept going, and it was it was amazing. It was honestly magical. So um, yeah. I hope that. I hope that this will open up some possibilities yeah. for. <laughs> I live in Chicago, so after a theater is you know. Um, not most of the year, I yeah. think. Um, now let but... me ask something. Do you do, do either in your in your travels with the sci-fi convention world? Did either of you ever work or or uh, speak with Anton Strout? Did you know Anton? No. I don't think so. He was a sci-fi. He sadly passed oh, yeah. away a couple uh, years uh, ago, but he sorry. was. Uh, I know he did a lot of the conventions, and he was a big yeah. sci-fi writer. And the so, name is know. actually sort of familiar, but I, I can't place it right yeah, now. He was a college friend. We went to college together. Uh, and, uh, okay. Yeah. So. All right. Anyway, okay. I want to get back to like we we stopped your career partway through. So you had so you talked about so you came to audiobooks through acting, yeah. um, and. And one question I have is that, would you say that's how most audiobook people get into the field um, or? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, yeah. there, I, I don't, I think you need to have that background usually to, to come into it. I mean, the, it, it, it's, like I said, it's a tough field to get into. I don't think someone who just has, you know, a, a good voice or is able to do that is, is going to be able to, you know, get into the, the just let alone the industry right. but to be able to sustain it as well now there are people i know um i have you know i know plenty of people in the audiobook world who that's all they do you right. know there's a mm -hmm. wonderful narrator who, who sadly passed away several years ago to katie kelligren who is you know talk about awards i mean she won mm. them all she was she was the top of the top and that's yeah. all she did. But she started, she trained, I think, you know, she started as a theater actress and then just got to the point mm -hmm. where she's like, this is what I love to do. This is all I yeah. do. Um, but usually I, I think the majority of people come into it who have, you know, a background acting either in theater. I, th or I think the only other route I've seen, and this may be anecdotal, but is uh, authors who read their own books and get successful at it and then start reading other people's books or something. Yes. Um, particularly if they have some, like Mary Robin Coel, who of course is also a puppeteer. So she has a a, a background in theater in that sense too yeah, and, yeah. and she ended up uh so but well um, so that's actually 
questions I have. So let's say you're you're not necessarily interested in trying to do this professionally for other people's books, but um, there are a lot of indie authors right now who are publishing on very much a shoestring, right? Mm-hmm. They yeah. um, they can't afford to hire a professional audiobook narrator for their for their books, I would imagine, and so they think I'm just going to record it myself. Do you think that is feasible? Or are they doing themselves a real disservice? I mean, I know in cover design, it's gotten easier to do covers um, yourself, but I can generally tell at a glance the difference between a professionally designed book cover and a, and something that someone mocked up on Canvas using you know elements that they grabbed. Yeah. So, so would you say that these indie authors, you know, I mean, a lot of them are trying to to spend no cash on putting their books out or, you know, you know, under a couple hundred dollars and a professional cover can run you a few thousand. And I'm guessing an audiobook. maybe, maybe just talk about the nitty gritty a little bit about the, the rates for this kind of work and um, whether people need to prioritize budgeting for pro work. I mean, I sort of feel like pros are always going to say yes to that, but, but uh. I mean, yeah, I, I do think you do. I do think you do yourself a disservice. I, now I understand the economics of it. I get it that it's, you know, when you want to get your work out there, I mean, whether you're a writer, an actor, a painter, whatever, like mm-hmm. you want to do it. And sometimes it's hard to get in those. Sometimes those doors are closed to you. Right. So you've got to figure out a way to do it. Um, but yeah, like you said, with the artwork, I think, you could be a, an amazing writer, but that doesn't mean that you that people are going to want to listen to your voice. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I've been doing this for a long time, and I am still not certain that people want to listen to my voice. I don't want to listen <laughs> to my voice. You know, um, but uh, you do. I, I only, you know, I've spoken to enough people. I was just talking to my friend the other day who was listening to a book, and uh, he was like, "I can't listen to it because the author's reading it." And they mm-hmm. sound, I can't stand their voice. They mm-hmm. don't know how to read it. There, There is a real, there's a skill to it, you know? Right. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and it, it takes a while and it's, it's, it's a lot. You know, I also have, I've been very lucky that I've worked with some amazing directors and um, uh, a, a good friend of mine, Scott Sherritt, who's, you know, he's, He's an amazing director, and that's who he does a lot of uh, author narrations and big celebrity books. And he's the guy they go to because he's able to get good performances out of people. But, you know, he and other people I've spoken to have said, you know, it can be really tough. And also a lot of people don't realize the stamina and how long it takes and what you need to do. It, it's mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's a lot. It's um so, you know, I think, look, if you want to get your you know well no i don't want to say this because i don't want to talk about uh but but just like as 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 a writer you want a good editor you want someone who's going to proof your book and edit it and get it out um so it's it's readable you know Uh, you don't want to Mm-hmm. you know sort of skimp on that and suddenly there's no grammar or punctuation because i've gotten i've gotten a few manuscripts of <laughs> that are like that you know wow. um but it, it's the same thing i feel like if you're going to do the audiobook you want people you don't want people to buy it and then go oh i don't want to listen to this because mm-hmm. i can't stand yeah. it because the but because the audio quality is bad i mean that's another thing right. too you know you really need some good audio quality there i've heard a few i've listened to a few samples of things that they just, they don't sound good. So mm-hmm. it's a long commitment you've got with something as a listener, as an audiobook listener, as yeah. a reader, whatever it is. You do want the quality to be as professional oh. as you can get it. And, and probably sometimes even if as a lay person, you don't necessarily even notice, but over time, you're gonna, it's gonna affect. I mean, if, even if you're not consciously aware that the audio quality is bad, it's gonna affect your experience of of listening to it. I so I'm so. super curious now because I, I have actually committed the sin of recording my own books. Um, a long time ago, like 30 years ago, when my first book came out, it was erotica and people kept asking me if I would do an audio version, if I would read my own work out loud. And I think because it's erotica, there is a certain, you know, sort of fantasy about the author that builds up. Um, sure. that is, that is a little different than from probably for most other genres, right? And at the time, you know, I was a 20 year old college student. I was pretty hot. Um, so, you know, so there was, 
<laughs> there's that whole thing happening. Um, so I ended up, I, I can't quite remember how I got access to a professional studio. I must have just paid somebody or my publisher paid somebody, although it was a tiny publisher. I don't think so. I think it must have just been me or maybe a friend doing me a favor. But I did end up recording in a professional studio these two. We did them as CDs back then in yeah. the old days um, of uh, poems and stories from, from the book that were released as Morning Song and Estelle Blue. And I will probably re-release them at some point. They, they've literally lived on CDs in my office for a very long time. So, um, and I don't know what the, what the quality of the recording is like. Um, I did have someone well, directing me at the time and who was, you know, who made me redo things. And I think because they were short pieces, it was not as exhausting as it would be reading an entire novel, right? These were like three page stories, one page poems, you know, and so I could take breaks and it was very, it was manageable. It was draining. I mean, the whole, I mean, even recording a podcast is draining. And so, um, which but I think if you did it, in a, in a, in a, I, I think also having good audio quality yeah. is going to help. You know, even if 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 someone's maybe not an experienced narrator, at least if it sounds good, if the quality's good, you're you're already ahead of the game. I think we'll find out. I'll, I'll, and I think there's a I think there's a there's there's sort of two different aesthetics or two. I mean, because because sometimes when you listen to an an author do it, it's not as when you listen to a professional actor do it, you're immersed in the world. You're immersed in the world of the story. You're not your your it's it's come alive the way it would if you were watching a movie sometimes when you listen to the author it's you're interested in who the author is so you're interested in it's like you're not necessarily it, it it the performance may not be as good as a performance but you sometimes you're interested in like oh who came up with this what is their take on it you know sure, so yeah, yeah. i mean it sort of depends on the length and it depends on the on the context and well there's sort of complementary things in some yeah. ways i mean to that point i will say when i was going into doing the unraveling i i think you might have sent um some a, a link um, yeah, I, uh huh. A podium of you reading it, and actually that was very oh, okay. interesting for another podcast, and that was yeah, very yeah, yeah. helpful for me. To okay. Sort of get this was when because I initially sent in the audition, and it yeah. was very funny because I remember you sent back. It was it was a it was a tome. It was a tome. Uh -huh. of <laughs> well, that's my that's that's this is everybody who knows me know this is a flaw of mine. Like, you know, the old there's the old Blake Blaise Pascal wrote, once wrote in a letter like, I'm sorry for the length of this letter. If I'd had time, I would have made it shorter. Like that's, you know, like I, I you know, like I, I, I before I know it, I've written 5000 right. words. So I apologize no, but, they sent me a couple of things and I, I was like, no, you no, know, no, here's it all was, my feedback. It, it was great, and it was very, it was super, super helpful. I'll, I'll admit, when I first got it, I was like, oh, Jesus. Oh, you know, my God, this guy. Is this going to be, like, is this going to be, do I want to get involved with this? Because you never know. Right, no, right, no, no, no. right. Because you, you never know totally. how, like, I'm I'm, I'm uh, good friends with uh, a, a guy named Jeff Rodkey, who's a great, wonderful author and a great screenwriter. Yeah. Yeah. And we first met because I did his, his audio books, and I was working at the Audible Studios, and they said, Hey, uh, Jeff wants to be in the studio with you. He wants to sit in. I was like, Oh Jesus! Uh -huh. you know, All right, I was be sitting there the whole time. Like this is gonna be. It's gonna I, be I just, a nightmare. I, I thought it was gonna. Be He's gonna wince every time you. Yeah, like, are you gonna say it that something. way? Can you say that? And he was. He was great. He was just curious. Yeah. He was like, I just wanted to yeah, see. Yeah. It was my first book. Right. Right. It, it, it was yeah. great. It was a great experience. It yeah. was. A, it was a similar thing when I get. And uh -huh. also, you know, there's a thing about actors. I was listening to. Um, Oh my God! What's his, uh, Bradley Whitford said it in an mm -hmm, interview mm -hmm. on Mark Maron's podcast, where he mm -hmm. goes, "Whenever an actor gets a note, can can we curse mm -hmm. on this or no? Are you do you cursing? Sure, go for it. <laughs> okay, we'll bleep you if we need to." <laughs> he said, um, "I think it was something like, whenever a director gives me a note, my my inclination is to go, fuck you. Why don't you love me enough?'" <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, authors know that too, right? Like, whenever you get oh, a yeah. piece or editing, you know, you're like, ah, I just like it. No, yeah. I don't want to do anything. So, so yeah. immediately, you know, I sent in the audition, and then I get this, like, you know, this huge, kind of like, Tome. Fuck you, why don't they like me enough? And then I, you know, I push that aside, and when I read it, I was right. like, oh no, this is great. This is what right. I need. Because, yeah. And you had even mentioned you were like. He's reading it very seriously, like it's a dystopian sci-fi, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what I was. Because well, that's the thing is uh, what the, where I was coming from is I'm like I, they probably only showed him this excerpt, and so he doesn't know what the whole book looks like. And yeah, so finally, I, I was trying to provide this context of like if you assume that if you're assuming this is like you know like the, a typical like because the first chapter is like this kid with their parents and 
you know, often books begin like that to like set the scene. And then this kid, of course, is going to go off into the wasteland and have dystopian adventures or something. And I, and I was like, no, 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 this book is like 75% at home with the family. Like yeah. it's a domestic well, when said, drama. In the when park. you said it's modern a, family, yeah. as soon as you said yeah. that, I was like, <laughs> right. Oh, right. okay. A different take. <laughs> because yeah, it was a very, head, yeah. I just saw it like, I was like podium. Yeah sci-fi uh, there's something about right, like shaved. Right. i was just skimming through i was like shaved head robes right, i was like right. oh minority report um you know right like, right, 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 right. i was Dystopian. thinking that, yeah you know, you know, <laughs> right Zardoz right or whatever right and right so well, you like, know what? yeah that yeah leads me into one of my questions so fred as as you're talking i love the sound of your voice and so i keep thinking like what have i written that i could hire fred to read for me <laughs> and, um, i think mostly stuff is not coming to mind for me but for ben and i'm thinking like <laughs> your, your well like your choice of games thing that you're working on you could have fred read a clip of that it would be great promotion for the game sure um sure. I'll, and, I'll pitch them and uh <laughs> and uh and some of your short stories and um and the the rpg that we worked on that i play tested with you i should, i should just tell I just got to tell Fred for context that we never have a guest on without Marianne sometime during the podcast, like pitching them on a project. I was going to say, wow, getting like Marianne always this is yeah. hires everyone. Well, you know what? We meet all these fabulous, talented people. I wouldn't think we have more work. And her, but, and that's your, your mind is like, oh, and we could get them to do this. And what, well, but, but also because I think great. you'd be great at it, but it leads into a question, which is, you know, the, the projects that I'm thinking of are the projects that have very, um, Jewish protagonist, right? Jewish character and culture. I can't tell from your name, Fred, whether you're Berm whether Fred Berman is Jewish at all, or it is. Indeed. Yes, it is indeed. Yes. Okay, so great. Um, but that leads, <laughs> that's one of the questions I, I had. Sorry, let me try and put this in a coherent manner. So when I had um, Bodies in Motion came out from HarperCollins, and when they did the audiobook, it's Sri Lankan immigrant fiction, they um, were very careful to uh, hire South Asian actors um, or to, to audition some South Asian actors and send me clips from two of them to choose between and to also give them feedback on whether I was comfortable with how they were doing the accents. Um, they did a great, both, both women did a great job and, and uh, I was delighted with who we ended up with, but it, it does feel somewhat important to me to, um, when you're, when you're working with a marginalized community and not, I mean, there's tons of South Asians in South Asia, but here in America, we're a marginalized <laughs> community, right, um, to try and get actors who will do it right, and if possible, get people from the group and and of course I'm I'm actually Sri Lankan and so you know there are some Sri Lankan actors in America not a ton of them fewer of them do voice work right so we we didn't I think narrow it down to try and get like a Sri Lankan Tamil actor would have been amazing but I don't think any were available at the time the book came out um and I was I was happy with who we did so as I'm as I'm picturing you I'm picturing you doing some of like Ben's RPG has all of this background material about the shtetl and the world that um, you're you're playing in as uh, as you're sort of running around the village and dealing with um, everything magic, making love, getting married, etc. Um, uh, abuse from the you know the <laughs> Europeans who come and harass your, you. Your question has turned into a pitch for my RPG. I just want to say <laughs> great RPG. I love it. Um, I think I think the question but, is. How much does in in casting audiobooks? How much yeah. does the match between the narrator and the source material and so on matter? Yes, how much that's do you question? Think it matters. Yes, and I mean, I, I mean, yeah. you know, that, that that's that's a question that's going on right now, all throughout the entertainment industry. Is um, you know, because there's the thing is, well, I'm an act. You know, we're we're actors. Can't we play everything? You know, I mean, th there's certain. No, I cannot play an African American character on you know on a tv show you know whatever mm -hmm. so th there, there are very distinct lines that can't be crossed or would be very wrong to cross mm -hmm. um but i think to answer your i mean i i i definitely think that as you get a little bit more known in the industry and i don't mean known like famous known i mean like as people know your work they know what your strengths are and hopefully they are saying okay i i know this narrator and i know they would be really good because of their background whatever it mm -hmm. is like i i get a lot of 
I get to do a lot of uh, uh, like rock bios, books about hmm. rock bands, because a lot of people know that I'm a big, you know, music fan. I've played in bands mm -hmm. all my life, and I was supposed yeah. to do. It was the, the heartbreak of my life. I was supposed to narrate the uh, the new Bob Spitz biography of Led Zeppelin. Um, oh wow! A huge Led Zeppelin poster uh -huh. right outside my booth here, <laughs> and they knew that, so they came to me, and I couldn't do it because I blew up my voice. It was awful. It was ah uh, yeah uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, but the guy who did is great. Um, but so I think, it, like with stuff like that. So like I've done a mm -hmm. lot of. Um, there's there's an author by the name of Ronald Balson who does a lot of World War II dramas that take place in Poland and Russia and about mm -hmm. the Jewish experience with that. And there, I, I've read most of them because you know the, the the people at Macmillan or the different publishing houses will say, okay, you know, I know we know that Fred connects to this because of his background or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I I think that certainly helps. Does that you know. But, you know, but then there is the, the argument that, but you know, we're actors, so that's our, it's our job mm -hmm. to take on other, you know, people right. and cultural cultures and genders. And, and especially with an audio book, it's, it's tricky mm -hmm. because if I'm doing a TV show or film or theater, I'm playing one role. Unless I'm yeah. doing a one person show, I'm playing one role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In these books, I'm playing all of them. I have to play every role. Right. So, right. 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 You know, I am going to be playing people of different genders of different races of ethnicities everything and you know mm -hmm. it's 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 because i'm telling the whole story and there's a lot of responsibility in that um and it's a and it can be a fine line it can be tricky too trying to figure out how to navigate that without mm -hmm. you know you don't want to be obviously you don't want to be offensive in any way um mm -hmm. and there are certain books where it will say this person's accent came through. There's a, so you have to do it. Mm -hmm. You can't get away with not doing it. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's always that's always a fine line, and it goes from book to book. Like a lot of people always say, um, you know, do you do character voices in your books? And it depends on mm -hmm. the book. You yeah, know, it depends on how it's written. Some it, it like calls out for that. You feel like, and others no. You just want to do it, keep it straighter. But it, it's. Mm -hmm. It's different from book to book, but I, but yeah, I think obviously as if you have a connection to, mm -hmm. you know, the culture that's represented in the book or the topic of the book or whatever it is, I think it definitely, it, it helps yeah. you as a narrator. I mean, my books- I have heard- Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll just say my book started in Sri Lanka in the 1940s and it, it was very immersed in the culture and- I, I'm trying to remember, like, white people don't show up till very close to <laughs> white but, people right, show up chapter 25. Not really. <laughs> yeah. the very end, you get a couple of them. But um, but so for that kind of book, I think it helps to have someone to oh, have absolutely. an actor who's immersed in the culture, whereas something some of my more contemporary stories, it is, as you say, like a mix of lots of different people. And and as a writer, we have this as well. Right. So. I will often create character. I write for Wild Cards, which is, which is a shared world. Some of my characters are Sri Lankan, um, but I have a um, I have a, a Mexican American guy is one of my characters in Deuces Down, who is a, a contractor and very different from me in every regard. And it's it's I, I hope I did a good job. I passed it by some people to be like, tell me if I'm getting something really wrong here, you know. And they did. They made my Spanish much more colloquial than I had been able to manage on my own, et cetera. So, um, but I, I think it worked. I, I mean, that's a that's a follow up question is to what because it's something with authors. I mean, authors are navigating. I mean, this, as you say, is a sort of conversation going on now where we mm -hmm. are much more aware of these you know, connections. We're much more aware of, you know, like, um, yeah, hashtag own voices. We're sort of like, you know, sort of like mm -hmm. the, the importance. The, the richness that people bring to representing their own perspective. And also at the same time, you know, we are, like you say, I mean, the same way actors are like, well, I act, I mean, we, we want to write the world, right? Yeah. You, and you want people to write, you don't want everyone to just stay in their lane. Like you actually, like it's, it's you know, sometimes sometimes white writers get criticized for writing the way they write characters of color. And then their, their re first reaction is often like, okay, I should only write white people, which is like, well, that's not great either, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, so, so, so it's like, no, learn, make mistakes, it's fine. But like, actually take, when, when you get criticism, like take that as like an opportunity to learn, like, oh, this, I, clearly I fucked up because this you're telling me this isn't the way it is so one thing that authors do i think that we're we're noticing this increased practice of like reaching out and and i mean there's a thing in in a kind of editing that's emerged in the last decade like called a sensitivity read where and i i just did one for a german uh writer who's writing a romance set in 
uh, Sud Tyrol, sort of the, the part of Austria that gets, got occupied by Italy in World War I, just on the eve of the Holocaust. So she has some like Jewish characters. It's basically this romance that she's writing that happens to be set right before the Holocaust. And she's like a, you know, non-Jewish white uh, German writer. So she was like, I should probably have a Jew look at this. <laughs> 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 and I, I know her from, you know, because I live here. And, and so I know some people, some science fiction writers in Germany and so on. So anyway, she, what's that? I was going to ask what the equivalent is for a sensitivity read, but finish what you're saying. So, or for uh, yeah, well, that is my question. But anyway, just to get to it, so so I did, you know, I she sent, I didn't want it, you know, not the whole novel, but she sent me like distilled down 20, 30 pages I read, and I gave her feedback. So I'm wondering, is there any, is there any way that you, tr if you do have a project where you're like, okay, I can handle most of this, but this one character I don't really know how to approach because they're so different from me, is that something? Is that a practice where, where you would? like reach out to somebody like, how would you do this? You know what I mean? Or, or ask them to listen to what you did or. Yeah, there have been, there's, there's definitely been times uh, here and there. I mean, it's not, it doesn't come up that often. Cause normally I'm just mm -hmm. trusting, you know, what the writer wrote. Um, yeah. And, and, and again, I mean, I'm not trying to do like crazy voices. It depends on the project, mm -hmm. but I never go mm -hmm. crazy, but mm -hmm. it's, it's more about, presenting the truth of the character yeah in that moment you know and and um it, you know it, yeah if it's something with an accent that i'm not familiar with i i'll i will go to someone who i know or now you know with youtube or you know i can mm -hmm. i can find all that stuff on there and try to get it there um but yeah i mean i think it, it, in 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 any type of acting, it always helps to, you know, any research you can do to get a little bit yeah. more inside. Yeah. You know, it's, again, it's hard because with a, with a, with a novel, it's so many characters. And yeah. It's so yeah. time consuming. So to go, to go like deep method into mm. every character, like <laughs> right. unraveling. It's not going to scale. I, the book would not, I wouldn't finish it. Well, no one, no one, I mean, the thing is, is people aren't going to pay you for that, right? Like the amount of time you would have to put in. No, right? and in the end, it's about storytelling, you yeah. know? It's, yeah. it's great, yeah. you know? And even to go back to what I was saying a little before, like watching your clip, you know, of you reading it, mm. mm -hmm. That was very helpful too, because obviously you know it's it's your story, but you're good. I was like, okay, so he knows the story he's telling. He's a good storyteller, and it became very aware just in your rhythm of how mm. you're reading it. I was going, mm -hmm. ah, okay, now I got it. Now I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the tone the place, and the place that it's got to yeah. live in. You know, when I mm -hmm. made that was mm -hmm. the adjustment I made for the you know for the re-record, which you know. Thank yeah, you. yeah, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. A test. that's a really you know. useful distinction to me because I think. Writers, you know, many of us have spent 30 years doing readings of our work and have gotten better at it over time. So I think I'm a decent storyteller in that sense, right? Which is still very different from being an actor. I remember the first time I, I tried, uh, I wrote a one act as part of a, a Chicago theater development project and they gave me a table read. And it was, I don't, magic is not the word. I cannot come mm. up with like when we, when the actors took the script and started reading it around the table and brought it to life, I was like, they have created a completely new thing yeah. what I wrote. And it's incredible. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Blew yeah. my mind. And I'm supposed to be sitting here like giving them notes and all I want to be is like, you're so great. You're all so right. great, <laughs> right? That is um, that is always when people read, um, that's amazing as a writer when people read your work because they bring out new things that you didn't even know were in there. And yeah. that is, is, you know, that's, is scary that's very from, exciting. From like, from the narrator's point of view, for yeah. me, I always get worried because yes, that's, that's, that's my job to take the words that are written and bring them, you know, off the page. Mm. But I often think, you know, God, I hope, is this what they envisioned? And a lot of times, it's yeah. like, and I've had people say yeah. to me, you know, like, oh my God, I never even thought that this right. person was going to sound like that. Right, and right. And thankfully, they liked it. But they're yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, I don't know, I'm taking a chance here. <laughs> is this what, right, right. Is this what they want? Is but this often be, it's, you know? it's, it's, but I mean, that's, it, that's kind of great. And that's something, something that, that sort of parallels something we've said on the podcast, even in terms of the act of reading. I mean, even if there's not a narrator as an additional step, even just between the writer and the reader, you don't know how the reader is going to read what you wrote, right? Yeah. Like you've done half the, when you write this book, you've done half the work. The reader is going to do the other half of the work when yeah. they read it because they're going to create these characters. And so, and what's interesting about 
um, hearing somebody narrate it is it's like you get a view as an author. You never get to hear the little voices that people are hearing mm -hmm. in their head when you read their book, right? Yeah. Well, they're, they're reading it to themselves. They're making something up. You never know what they made up. But yeah. if you hear somebody narrate it, you actually have a window into somebody else breathing life into those characters. And it's very uh it's That's very exactly what Jeff Rodkey was saying when he was in there. He goes, I wasn't in there to like criticize and to pick yeah. apart. Yeah. He's like, I was just curious of what I wrote. You know, yeah. like what it actually was <laughs> right. and what it sounded what it? like right. you know, to right. someone else. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I think exactly. if you're going to get, See, uh, we should break soon, actually. We should take okay. a break. break. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in one last thing, and then Ben can pick up when we come back. But uh, okay. I think... Where, where I do see writers potentially getting actors into trouble is if they if they is in the realm of accents. I feel like that's where it could be very easy to go wrong, right? In terms of, you know, I just met um, the woman, uh, Sibyl Kikeli, who plays Shay on Game of Thrones. Um, and oh, wow, yeah. It was very super. Oh my God. She's, she's, I have a girl crush. She's so awesome. Yeah. Uh, she like spends all this time working against uh, violence against women. And she's just as beautiful off screen. She's just gotten off a plane. It was like 2 a.m. for her with jet lag from Germany. And she was stunning and so kind. And so, anyway, great on that she's, she is awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, they rewrote. They changed the character, George's character, um, who had been a local village girl to being an immigrant, right? Because she has an accent and they could have, I, I assume she is an accomplished enough accent that she could, actress, actor that she could have worked to drop that. But I, I think it made it better. It enhanced the story, having her be an immigrant. It, you know, added more to sure. And I was talking to George about it the next morning and he was saying that, she was one of that actor. Sibel was one of the um, actors who who brought more to the character than he had put on the page. He liked the character he'd originally written, and he really mm. loved what she had made of the character, all the depth that she had brought to it. And um, so I think that's I don't know that's an example of how it can go really right. Um, so I mm -hmm. want to throw that out there. So if actors are nervous, don't be nervous. Give it your all. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that was it. Your 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 it it, it 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 was going one direction and then it. Watch out! Yeah. Watch out for accents because and in the end, just trust yourself. Go for the accent. Yeah, we're yeah. all watch out for accents because we're all special. But that's what it is. I mean, <laughs> I mean really, yeah. that's that's the. Any actor will tell you, like anyone who's, you know, really made it big or done well, it's always because they're just bringing themselves to it, you know, and it's eventually people catching up to that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess what I was going to say, watch out for accents, because, I mean, this is true for writers as well. It can turn into caricature, right? And so when we're trying to represent dialect on the page, it often, if you represent it too heavily, it comes across as caricature rather than how people would talk. We There's like a, a little bit of a formula that I use of like representing dialect about a third of what it actually would be if you heard it. Um, so if I were, you know, if I were writing my parents talking or my aunties and so on, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put in every yeah. instance of, of how they would change the language. I'll put in about a third and that's enough to give you the flavor. And I'm guessing that actors have to think about that kind of thing when they're, when they're, reading a script um, or uh, for an audiobook and thinking, okay, here is this character supposed to have a, a heavy Tamil accent or a light uh, Israeli accent. I don't know what that would be actually, um, et cetera. You know, it's supposed to talk like my dad who is, you know, emigrated, you know, as a kid versus my grandfather who emigrated as a grown man and the changes in how they speak. Um, Anyway, I just it also well, yeah, and and, and that's that goes back to this thing about the different, you know, verisimilitude versus realism. You, you don't necessarily do the thing exactly as it truly is, but the thing that will communicate to the reader or the listener, you know, how it is, how you know what I mean, that will evoke for them is maybe not. I mean, I know that as as a writer, at least that that like um, my famous story about this is the the thing I wrote that was sort of a pastiche of the Bible, and I originally wrote it really the way the Bible. I mean, there were a lot of the gaps. <laughs> and eventually I had to back that off to where you get the sense, the feeling, it evokes the feeling that you imagine you're reading the Bible, except it doesn't remind you why you don't read the Bible, you know, yeah, right. so <laughs> it's like, I get that. <laughs> yeah, I, 
I think that's a lot, especially with audiobooks, you know, because there are so many, uh, with a lot of them, there's so many characters, and sometimes it can be, I mean, th you know, with the unraveling alone, just all the different characters mm. and the different, you know, yeah. where am I pitching this voice and this and there, you know, it's, you want to just make it so everyone is recognizable and you get the feeling, yeah. um, especially if it's, again, it depends. I mean, if the accent is really important to the mm -hmm. story, then yes, it would be, especially if it's narrated all the way through, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, it, if it's a, you, you if you're know, doing train spotting or something. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to want someone who's, who's, you know, can, who is, who is an actual Scotsman Ooh. or mm -hmm. Scotswoman or who can really nail yeah. that accent. Otherwise it's yeah. just going to be distracting. Um, yeah. You know, but y you want to, at least for me, I want to try to get it as, as spot on as I can, you know, just because mm -hmm. you, know, you just don't want people listening to it and going, oh, and it t it t it'll take them out of it, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think like a lot of these things we were saying, it's sort of like, it you, you know, we're, we're noting that it's hard, but that doesn't mean don't do it, right? It just means yeah. that that's the work, right? Is to try to, is to try to do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. you wanted to take a break, Marianne, so we can return well, we after should, these we're, messages. We're trying to be better about not exhausting our guests. So <laughs> we're going to take five minutes. Okay. We'll come back. And I'm hoping when we come back, Fred, if we could hear you read a little bit from the unraveling, is, is oh, that geez. possible? Uh, <laughs> maybe, Wait a minute, no? you're springing this on him? Know, we can also we'll drop an excerpt. Or, we don't or, have to make... We you don't, don't have, have to. You don't have to do or... it live. We we can also just drop an excerpt right, into the, a as a bonus episode. Okay, okay. So you don't have to do it live. I know. I want to hear a voice. I don't know. Could you do Tim on for us? I... Maybe or. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so um, okay. We do. I I do have other. Okay, wait, I do I do have other questions too. Okay. All right. When we return. Uh, for part two, Marianne has stepped out, but she's gonna swoop in at some point. So anyway, you were you were about to ask me a question, Fred. Oh, I w <laughs> I'm just curious the genesis of the unraveling and how the whole I the idea of uh, um, you know uh, talking about the ideas of gender and and yeah. you know, gender assignment and whatnot and and how that came to you to go into this this grand uh, not dystopian sci-fi future. Yeah, well, I guess it's both utopian and dystopian, right? Yeah. It's sort of a, it's sort of a mashup. Um, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think it's a lot of different um, factors that came together. Um, I mean, it's something that I've always been. I actually wrote a whole essay that hasn't come out yet, but I I, uh, I, I intend to put it out somewhere about sort of you know my original like my like my like I don't know gender history. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a I mean cis man so it's not that uh and yet i am very dissatisfied with where our culture has arranged <laughs> you know what i mean it's not like i can't inhabit that what my our culture has decided that i should sure. be but there's always a little like really this is yeah. how you this guys decided to set this, this up yeah this is how we're supposed to be yeah no i got you <laughs> this I, I, is, I, I get you this is my it's weird if i it's i'm supposed to do this but not that oh, okay yeah. i mean you know it's so and there's, and just, you know, I mean, so I wrote a little autobiographical thing that I, I'm going to publish at some point about um, just, you know, the experience of like, like uh, there's some, the, the sort of when you, you know, it, it kind of, you're good at getting used to anything, but if you go back and look kind of with an anthropologist's eye at like what we do to little boys and little girls to turn them into what our culture expects them to be, like there's, there's, there's these moments of real, like, you know, that, that, that are kind of brutal of like, oh, this is the side of the line that you're supposed to be on and this is the way you're supposed to behave and, um, you know, and, and, you know, and also I'm, I'm bi, so, and I, I think I, you know, kind of, uh, didn't come out to myself until I was like 27. So there was a lot of like uh, looking back on childhood and everything. There was a lot of like, okay, don't cross that line. Don't act too, you know, much in this way or don't, you know, like, like th just this, you know, weird um, alienating way that our, that our culture deals with gender. And then I had kids. My kids are now uh, 18 and 21. So, okay. so the entire time that I was, you know, and I started having the genesis of the idea they were little and it's weird to teach kids. It's weird, you know, as parents, you're sort of this, have this dual role where you want your kids to just flourish and be free and be able to be anything, but also you know that the world is gonna judge them. So you're trying to get them to act 
in a way that won't get them targeted. So you're like, no, honey, you have to put your clothes back on on the tram. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you, you yeah, have yeah, to yeah, enforce yeah. society's rules on them, right? I mean, and and it's weird, you know. And they're like, why is this this? And so many of their questions, they were like, why is this this way? Why do we have to do this this way? And I'm like, that's just the culture you live in. If you live somewhere else, it would be different. But this is how it is here. Yeah. And you know, you want to protect their souls, but on the same time, you've kind of got to be this agent of oppression where you're making them at least to some extent conform to the you know go to school brush your teeth put your clothes on you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah the it's, entire, it's, it's a constant you're taming reminder. them you know i i always yeah. remember because I, I have two kids as well and i remember when my son was was very young we were in target and we were looking at um you know and i and i've always considered myself very open and like i said yeah you know, what i was saying before the break one of my best friends is trans and and so yeah. i've always considered you know, that sounds so awful to say, well, one of my best friends is trans. Right. You know, I, no, I have lots of trans friends. Like, my credentials. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God, I just sound, sure. I just disgusted myself. <laughs> anyway, no, but you know what I mean? Like, I consider yeah. myself like an open parent. And But I remember we were yeah, targeting yeah. and my son was looking at like little, um, I don't know, like cuppies, you know, juicy cups or whatever. Yeah. And I remember he was looking at a yeah. pink one. There was the blue uh-huh. ones and the pink ones. Right, and right. he was going to grab a pink one. And instinctively, I was like, Oh, don't don't you maybe want to get? Don't you want the blue, blue one? one? Right, and I, that's... right as I was saying sure. that, I swear to God, right as I was saying <laughs> like, that, oh my God, this what am I little doing? boy turns the corner wearing uh-huh. a full-on fairy ballerina outfit, <laughs> with, like, sparkles, and I was like, "Then take any color you want, get the pink." I was like, "Wow!" Oh. As if the little boy who came around the corner was like the fairy god, but I'm here to just for to, uh, it to really you know, was. disrupt gender. It was like a smack in my <laughs> Did face. Did somebody like, say you... gender binary? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was amazing, and I was like, "No, no." No, 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 do whatever color you want. Do whatever right. you want. Like, but it's but, you're but right. it's really interesting to note that moment, and you note that as a parent, and it could be about gender, it could be about a lot of things. Where it's just like, where it's just like you're noticing the voice within you that is the the culture is propagating itself. Where it's like, these are the rules I learned. This is how you're supposed to, yeah. you know. And and you're like, is that the way that I don't know? So my kids always from from day one, you know, they challenged me, and you know, they're they were very much like like why is this this way? And, you know, it made me rethink a lot of things. So anyway, so one thing I want, I mean, I wanted to, a lot of the unraveling, of course, is about parenting and being a parent, being a child, like both of those relationships. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of it was drawing on my own childhood and my experience as a parent and, and how, um, you know, the, the, the love and also the tensions in that, like, and, and, you know, very much the drama of the unraveling is that a lot of, a lot of it is the parent's desperately trying to force the child to conform to the social norms because there are consequences if you don't and at the same time we're we understand them we're also rooting for the kid to say no i i i refuse to conform so you know which was lovely as and that that was a really lovely surprise in reading the book just not knowing again because i saw i just had a little snippet of it so i assumed this Mm -hmm. is what it was but then to really see the journey of all the you know the parents of all the fathers You know, yeah. Um, yeah, that was really lovely. And just to see where they went and the schisms and whatnot and the alliances and yeah, uh, yeah, it was like I said, it was it was it was it was a nice, very human surprise. I don't know why I didn't expect it to go that way, but um, it was great and, you know, very relatable as a parent, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting. I'm mean, going to talk a lot on the podcast about how it's not the book I really set out to write. I thought I would. I, I had a more conventional idea of what a science fiction book was supposed to be. You know, yeah. there were supposed to sort of be heroes and villains and a big bad and a big change and things to say. And I just found myself like, and I had a, you know, the book that we ended up with is the B plot because the A plot, which had like sort of the grand force of history and people, I just felt myself increasingly unconvinced by. And I really mm. cared about these these individual care I introduced fifth and fifth family just as kind of a lo- an illustration of like well what's at stake in this world let's let's zoom in on some little you know there's the, there's sort of these titans fighting about the fate of the world but let's zoom in on some little family and like what life's like for them but then I just found that's what I really related to is like mm-hmm. what is life like for this family in this very strange future world yeah. and I just toss the a plot <laughs> you know? so interesting wow. you know? and uh, and I ended up with with this so um, but I want one thing I wanted to ask was what um, uh, well I actually am interested in hearing more about what that was like to discover and what choices you made and what 
uh, you had to, you know, both to both to bring out the world building and to bring out. I mean, there's also one thing we haven't talked about is there's the characters. But there's also in this book all these interludes that aren't really yeah. in a character's voice, or they're in a different character's voice or something. So it'd be interesting to hear about that. And also, you know, and how or or all the stuff around around gender and everything. Oh, one thing I wanted to say: we were talking about the original round of feedback. Um, where where I got the where, where you know the very in the beginning when when I got the first uh, audition tape and I sent notes and stuff and that go round and one of the things and and I was like he, you know he doesn't have the context because it this looks like this first chapter looks like it could be the beginning of this dystopian yeah. adventure story like we're used to and I I was like so the modern family thing was funny but also the gender thing where I was like how do you get across that none of these characters are men or women. Um, and I remember saying, and I don't know if this is helpful at all, but I was just flailing for like, what modern, which is, it was a different way of thinking about it because of course writing it, I was, you know, it's in the far future. I was drawing on these things, but to try to visualize how it would be, I was like, I was like, as a, as a, as a first approximation, maybe like think of the average veil as RuPaul and the average uh, state is Tignataro. <laughs> that was extremely helpful. No, I, I mean, that's, it's because as an actor, you want those it's, it's sometimes it's just the littlest thing. It's just a tiny thing, mm -hmm, just a tiny mm -hmm. note. That's what, at least for me, that's what I'm always looking for. Just like the one thing that's going to go, got it. And right. some of the best directors I've ever worked with. I mean, I worked with this guy, David S. Bjornsson, who's amazing. And I always remember he would just he would just give me like one thing, even just like a look. Or, uh -huh. uh, you know, we he worked we worked in a, in a play together um, or, or just an action or something. And I was like, got it. That's it. Like, that's all you need. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, and especially with audiobooks, is all your voice, you know? And that yeah, was yeah. an issue with this. Once I once I realized, oh, that's what this is, and I have to figure out, there's there's got to be, th this has to sit in a certain place vocally just because mm -hmm. of... Mm -hmm. who these people are and the genders and you know there is because it's so easy if somebody's listening they're going to immediately we can't not immediately decide if a voice is supposed to be a male voice or a female voice you know what yeah. i mean it's really hard to destabilize and, that and as a narrator that's male or female that's always yeah. the most difficult choice when you're reading as a male when i'm reading a female character mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. for all my female narrator friends when they have to read a male character it's yeah. always that am i how far I mean, yeah. I always laugh. People would be like, so when you do female voices, do you talk up? I'm like, no, I don't go. Right, 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 right. Well, you know, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd be working if I was doing it. Right, that. right. Don't do but that. there is that. There, it's always that fine line of how do you do it? You want to differentiate. And and to be honest, if I mean, sometimes you look at the – I try not to read reviews, but sometimes I'll go on Audible mm -hmm. and you look at the reviews – and every listener has a different opinion as well. Mm -hmm. Sure, know, sure. Everyone, sure. you know, I yeah. literally looked at reviews for books I've read, and there'll be one will be like, this is the greatest narrator I've ever listened yeah, to. I've yeah. listened to anything. And then the next one is like, this guy made me like physically ill. Right, it's terrible. Voice. I <laughs> yeah, hated it. Yeah, so yeah. some people, and I've read reviews, yeah, people just... are like, I wanted to hear more of a differentiation between the male and female right. voices. And then other reviews would be like, what is this guy doing? You know, it should just right, be straight over... voice. Anyway, mm. so with yeah, with, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But that was particularly, particularly inter No, I still didn't get it right. <laughs> that was very interesting with, yeah. um, with with this particular book. There we go. Particular. Uh -huh. I'll stick to that with this particular book, just because the genders are mixed. So getting that going back originally, getting that mm -hmm. note about the RuPaul and the Tignatero, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, great, I can latch on to that. Yeah, and yeah, it, yeah. And it made it easier, and then within that. I can find the fluctuations and then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, in terms Cause each of, one is different. So yeah, yes. yeah, sure. That's so interesting. You know, I, I'm sorry. I, I would have assumed that you would be pitching up for female voices and pitching down. And I don't even know why I assume that I, I don't, I listen to a ton of podcasts. I tend to not listen to audiobooks generally because I get impatient and I, I can read faster. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to denigrate your entire field. Many people, my husband. Just, just Marianne, just listen to it on 1.25 speed. That's it. <laughs> and the voice will always up. Yeah, right. I don't know. My husband listens to them constantly. So I feel like he's he's pulling the weight for our household and keeping you all employed. But um, but the I did love the Lord of the Rings audiobook, which we listened to as we were driving across the country. And that oh, was cool incredibly well done and Who narrated that? 
Um, I don't, I don't, this was 20 years ago. I'd have oh, to go okay, back so and look. Right. This is a long time ago. Uh, it was in the, it may have been a cast um, rather than. Oh, oh yeah, there are, there are a lot of multicasts. Those are. Yeah, awesome. yeah. It was, it felt very real at the time. So, but I, you know, like if I'm singing, I'm not a good singer, but I do sing uh, with friends and, you know, in order to get everyone into a key that we can sing in, you might, you know, sing a line and then like drop it a few notes or raise it a couple notes, right? And you change the register up or down. So I guess I had assumed that that was part of what you do, but maybe it's not. No, it absolutely is. And that, that that's what I do. I mean, when, okay. when I... I, I just do it sort of naturally now that depending, and, and again, it depends on the role and the type of character it is, but usually for a female character, I will pitch it just, again, you don't, you never want to go into caricature, but just to right. keep it the distinction, or even a lot of times it's rhythm too, just mm -hmm. different, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, what, what's their rhythm. What I do a lot in my head, which helps a lot, and I did this with, with your book, and I do this with most of the books, is as I'm going through like that, this is why, again, when you said RuPaul and Tignatero, that mm -hmm. was talking my language because I like to cast all the roles. So mm. Oh, say, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Whether, whether it's with someone famous or just like uh -huh. a neighbor or right, someone that I right, saw right. at the store, I'll say, right, okay, right. that's How this would they person. say this? Like, um, yeah. which one? I think Smistria was. Mm -hmm. Was it Smistria? I can't remember. One of them was. Like, oh, I would love to know who everybody was. <laughs> If I had it, I could look like the one, Mystery, know, uh, yeah, the grumpy that, one. I think that was B. Arthur, maybe. That was more. Like oh, nice, nice, thing. totally. I um, totally see that. <laughs> but, but then I don't think you know. But then it's not like I'm not going to try to imitate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him. Sure, know, sure. It's just yeah, I can't remember uh, all the characters. I know there was definitely there was a Stanley Tucci feel. There was a B. Uh -huh. Arthur. There was the <laughs> RuPaul Tignatero. Um, yeah, I, I'm blanking on some of the other. Um, oh, there was a um, Bob Balaban was. Um, huh. Uh, the the character, uh, 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 I'm blanking on his name. I'm sorry, I don't have the script in front of me. Who's the, uh, mostly uh, uh, in the garden? Um, oh, uh, Arevio, maybe. Oh, that's or, yeah, yeah Nupolo yeah, yeah. or Arevio. Yeah, and one just of the two of them. Yeah. Of, um, Arevio. Yeah, maybe. You know, anyway. it, it was just, yeah. it, just it, and again, it's not like, okay, mm -hmm. that's who this character is. I'm going to Sure, him. sure. But it's so just it's a touch more, point. Yeah, just to say, okay, I'm going to try to follow the, I'll write it down and then I'll try to forget. And then I'll do like the, you know, just sort of the rhythms. And a lot of times mm -hmm. I'll do it and then I'll go, oh, you know what? I got to yeah. switch that. I got to reverse yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Switch it up. Something will be revealed later. So I'll go back and. Right, and right, it. sure. Um, but it just helps me as, you know, to keep it straight and just to differentiate mm -hmm. it, hopefully. That um, makes a lot of sense, just to have the touch point of, like, how would they say it? And as you say, it's not, because, and I think that the thing about pitch is, well, in terms of what you were saying, Marianne, is, again, I think it's about, ver it sounds like it's about that verisimilitude and realism. If you go slightly up, it's enough to suggest it. If you actually try to do it in the actual pitch that a woman was speaking at, it would come across as caricature, yeah, right? Like, sense. that's what I'm hearing, right? Also, so it's it's more like suggesting differences right. then. And, and Patricia Clarkson mind. was in there too, I remember. I can't remember. Who, who was? Patricia Clarkson. Ah, okay. Was something wow, that, I would love I just, to know who was who because that's that's such a that's so I fascinating. Just, again, it's just I'll throw these names and then that'll just inform. Yeah, yeah. Where, what, you know, how and then, you and then deal I see with it? That. And yeah. I never, I, I generally don't practice it beforehand. I like to just mm -hmm. do it and see instinctually, mm -hmm. and then I'll go. Okay, that didn't work, or that did work. You know, it's just sort of. Well, I was going to ask a little about process. How much do you do you read the whole thing once through first? Do you sort of go chapter by chapter? Do you go back and do the record as you go, or do you go back and do re-records? Like how, how much do you? So for for a work of fiction, ninety nine percent of the time, I'd like to read it all the way through if I can. Mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard. Sometimes yeah. like, you get crashes and you get a script, and so you sort of have to. Right. Stay. But. Only because I don't want to be surprised. I don't want to get to the end and the last time mm -hmm. be like, and then his German accent, which was never right. Mentioned. You know, and you're like, oh, <laughs> right. Shit. right, 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 um, sure. You know, you don't want that. Or, yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah. And just to get an idea of who the characters are, and so I can just track and start and start mm -hmm. putting down those, you know, those tracking points of, all right, okay, this person mm -hmm. I think is so and so. I'm going to pitch this person here. Okay, this person right. has an accent. I got to figure that out. Oh, this person really is the bad guy at the end. So, you know, mm, I have to figure out me, how to yeah. track that. Um, uh -huh. With nonfiction, it's a little. Obviously, you don't have to, you know, th there's no surprise like that, but you still want to. I still like to go through because, you know, words I don't. 
know how to mm-hmm. pronounce or stuff mm-hmm. like that. You want to get pronunciations yeah. right. Um, and yeah. it just makes it easier. The more prep you can do beforehand, the easier mm-hmm. the record's going to be, the less time you have to stop and keep going back. Um, yeah. You know, that's that's still, like, particularly with this book. So I'll go through, like, with your book, I mm-hmm. went through and I tried to highlight each. It's, it's, a, it's so much dialogue and a lot of people talk at yeah. the same time. So just trying to keep that straight. You know, mm-hmm. that, again, it'll just make it easier when I'm actually recording if I don't have to keep right. stopping, and stopping and figuring out. And I know that because of the, that's another thing we didn't mention, but because there are multiple bodies, so the perspective is in multiple places. A lot of people, I think, have found that, like, can be, <laughs> people have gotten lost with the dialogue in that sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, I tried to do a lot to mark that and bring that out, but I think that's uh, another challenge, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I think the more prep you can do going into it, it just it, it, it makes it easier. So that's what I like to do. There have been times, it's not often, but there have been times when I've gotten a book like super last minute and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll just, just go. go. Um, yeah. You know, there have been times, certain ser- excuse me, certain series that I've done, uh, mm-hmm. it gets a little easier if it's the same characters. You know, you're sort mm-hmm. of like, okay, or I know where this, how this author writes. I know right, what the right. rhythm is. So, um you know, I don't have to delve. I'll still, I still have yeah. to read it, you know, as much as I can all the way through and figure yeah. it out. But every now and then there have been times when I've just had to go sort of chapter to chapter. And I know narrators mm-hmm. who don't read anything before they start. Yeah. You know, yeah. which I'm like, yeah. I, I don't think I could do that. Yeah. I've done huh. it. It's because I right. had to, but it's not, just in, you know. in necessity. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So were there other choices about like bringing up the world building or the gender or anything? Was there, were there things that you remember that you could talk about where you had to, where you made sort of decisions about going one way or another in terms of, of, uh, well, it always, it always came back to, I think it always came back to the Tignatero RuPaul. Like uh-huh. You were saying, and, <laughs> you know, and, I, and thinking about it now, when I was, when I was throwing out those lists of actors, I mean, they all were, most of them were male. And so that was mm-hmm. something that I had to purposely say, no, 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 I can't, th- th- there's mm-hmm. gotta be. And even though I would, yeah. I would, I would say a male, say like Stanley Tucci or something. I was thinking like Stanley mm-hmm. Tucci, like devil wears Prada, but I'm like, okay, yeah. but, but there's still gotta be the distinction that this is neither male nor female. Right, so, right, so right, right, just right. The rhythm, you know, the feel, the air mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. you get, the air that surrounds him and how do I place yeah. that? So that was always throughout this book. It was always really trying to keep in mind. And you mentioned this in in your notes too that mm-hmm. it's that most of the time they skew towards maybe more towards RuPaul, but not all the time. You know. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 Exactly. Humans, all of you know. Just right. Like right. Most of the time, men right. do this. Right. It's it's no. more it's like a set of expectations. This is what their culture expects of them. And then they're going to conform to it with greater and lesser degrees of success. Right. right. So or or variations or ways that they defy it or ways that they. So, you know, it's yeah. yeah. They're, and they're all so, they're all different in that so way. I had so to be very aware of that more than more than a lot of other books that I'll work on. I mean, that was always sort of in the back of my my mind in mm-hmm, terms of the mm-hmm. world building is always keeping it within those. Yeah. Within yeah. those parameters, but also outside those parameters, because there aren't any parameters, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. In, in how you wrote it. Um, but it was always just, that was sort of the touchstone that, you know, this mm-hmm. this is a world where gender is a very different thing. So how do I reflect that mm-hmm. vocally? And then there's like, there's interludes, there's a quiz, there's a, there's a, a term paper, like there's a bunch of different yeah. sort of those, uh, set those pieces. Were more like, you know, trying to keep, I, I would try to, those in my head, I'm like, these are a bit more neutral, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is, uh-huh, yeah. Um, and, but yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a challenge. It was, it was definitely one of the more challenging books I've narrated, which is fun. <laughs> and I mean, that in a good way, yeah. you know, yeah. just always yeah. kept things, you know, there are definitely times when I, where I would get to a point and I really just have to stop and be like, mm-hmm. am I going to do that? Right. Am I going to do that? <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. And also, in the back of my head, I'm like, I would like the author to be happy with this. I don't right. Know. Like with every book, I'm like, I don't know if they're going to like this choice, but sure, sure. I'm going to make it and, and hopefully it, it works. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely very cool. Can I say- What were you going to say, Marianne? Well, I just want, I want to kind of circle back around a little bit to one of the questions I asked before that I think got lost, which is- um, which, which is more of the nitty gritty kind of stuff about budgeting. And I imagine there's like a really wide range of what 
professional voice actors charge, right? Yeah. Um, there certainly is for cover design. Um, and so and it's also probably different if you're talking about like an indie self-publishing thing or if you're talking about well that's like that's, a, that's, another, that's another question right so let's say and, and a lot of indie books these days are shorter right because they're they're dropping 299 novellas and things like that rather than full-length novels so could you maybe just give um let's say there's someone out there they're going to indie publish a book and they they don't have a big publishing house behind them um what would they is it a per word rate a per page rate like when no, and what's well, the range maybe there, well <laughs> there, there's there's union rates there's minimum union okay. rates so you know um, that's helpful yeah yeah so i'm you know that those are stuff that you know you could is there a website know. you could we could link to that would have that posted I, or I no i don't know it offhand i'm sure if you googled you okay. know maybe well maybe, we'll try and hunt that up so yeah. um, okay. and those are per hour or well so uh, the, the way they do it now it's per finished hour Mm -hmm. That's it used to be different. Okay. It used to be like a per hour type thing. Um, but for, for many years now it's a per finished hour. So it's however mm -hmm. long the book mm -hmm. ends up being. So yeah. Which again as a as as a narrator, that's why to me it behooves you to do as much work as you can beforehand. Um mm -hmm. because you wanna get you're getting paid by the per finished hour. So mm -hmm. if you can uh you know, the faster you're able to work and get through it, I don't mean faster, like rushing through it. Yeah. But if you're constantly stopping and starting and stopping and starting. Right. And, it's the most and, efficiently, as efficiently course, as possible. Yeah. I couldn't think of the word efficient. Yes. It's the most efficient way to do it. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, you know, and yes, and there are different scales for different narrators and, and um, it's also depending on the project. I mean, my rates are different, you know, from, publisher i mean it's all around the same world and it's you know there are people starting out who you know it's there's there's for instance audible who a lot of people go to um for their rates i mean they have like a new narrator's rate and an experienced narrator rate and then mm -hmm. you know the pro experience or whatever but even though yeah. those are sort of base minimums and then people you know sort of expand on there so that that would be my suggestion you know to find out what i always say go with you know the union rates um and i'll be perfectly i mean i've had people come to me with indie stuff and 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 depending on what it is i mean obviously i like getting a higher rate if i can <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm always gonna go for that um but you know there are there are situations where that can fluctuate but i'll never go lower than the union minimum for anything mm -hmm. like and I'll, you know and, and most people i don't think would at least who are union you know professional narrators so i think that's yeah. always that's the a, place that's where a, you, you yeah, always have to start a, there you know that's a really is that a way. is that a specific separate union separate from like i mean i know there's like it's equity and sag, sag and Yes. Yeah, oh, okay. After. So it's, it's part all, of SAG-AFTRA. It's, it's all within that union. Yeah. That's really interesting. Uh -huh. In in writing, we have you know CIFWA, the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers Association, uh, or Writers of America. Again. It's the closest yeah. thing we have yeah. to it's a union. We have. Very it's far it's away from a union. <laughs> very far away from union. We set they set <laughs> guidelines for this counts as pro, this counts as semi pro, um, and so magazines that will pay you at the pro rate, which is, you know, a range, but uh, it has a minimum, um, are then uh, eligible it's, it's, uh, for, for seven, a certain- Seven cents a word now still, or? I think it might be seven cents a word. Um, I, don't, I don't, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but it uh, that that qualifies you for membership in CIFWA if you sell three professional quality level stories, right? Mm -hmm. And then that gets you access to things like um, being able to get your healthcare through CIFWA, which is uh, pretty critical if you are an American and yeah. uh, trying to make your living full time. But as it's, a writer, it's so. I mean, that and, is and quite also, interesting. Well, and, and let me just, and I'll just say yeah. this is a little plug for CIFWA because we haven't talked about it much, but they also mm. do a lot in the way of legal services, which is yeah. really helpful if you are in an argument with Amazon, You're in, maybe you're an indie writer and Amazon has recently just like dropped your account and owes you thousands of dollars, CIFWA can help you. Or maybe the... you're Alan Dean Foster and Disney decided it doesn't own you any money for any of the Star Wars tie-ins you wrote in the 80s. For example. 
Yeah. So, so yeah, they go to bat for writers a lot. And also they look out for predatory scam artists and mm. so on. Like there's a, there's a bunch of, of, of stuff they do. But it is interesting that, I mean, you know, the, the Hollywood and Broadway and all that, those are real unions. I mean, those are unions that have lasted since you know, and, 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 and very, are very strong. The, what we're talking about in the, in the crow's writing world is nothing like they, they can't call a strike. You know what I mean? It's not a right, union in yeah. that sense. It, what, what they have is, I mean, it's, it's actually amazing that they have as much influence as they do, given that really all they're really doing is saying, these are our membership qualifications. What they're saying mm -hmm. is 10 cents a word in order to be counted as a market for our membership qualifications. And just that by itself, just that essentially symbolic um, uh, gesture it does have the effect of stabilizing markets where because people want to be considered pro markets. Um, and so and also, I guess the the award, like the best, uh, the, the best, pro, the difference between going for the semi pro zine award or the pro zine award, like being considered a pro magazine, you have to pay these rates. But it's really doesn't have the teeth that an actual union has. I mean, it's not like nothing like the writer's strike in Hollywood where, you know, pens down. Um, and so it's amazing that they have even as much influence as they do to to get to kind of standardize those rates when it's essentially a very voluntary opt in kind mm. of kind of organization. But but uh, but it's interesting to see how those are, you know, uh, uh, parallel, you know, yeah. how how those historical parallels emerge because, um, uh, you know, they don't have the I mean, it's it's. I think I think fiction prose fiction writers are somewhere in between. Like Hollywood writers really have unions, and they really like can be a writer's strike. Um, prose writers have independence; they own their own IP, and they've got you know CIFO, which is a, and, and things like that. I mean, there's a romance writers one, um, which are like you know essentially volunteer organizations that don't have the muscle of unions, but are at least organized and and go to bat for writers' individual rights. And then there's like, I think the worst offer, like comic book writers, where the tradition has been, I think it's got a little better, but they are traditionally were just work for hire, you know, sweatshop, uh, you know, yeah. Bob King got $500 for Batman, you know, <laughs> so. And now they're not getting, I mean, I was just reading an interview with, uh, well, not an interview, but a, uh, uh, um, David Aha, who's with the, the artist who, with Matt Fraction, did the Hawkeye series, My Life is a Weapon, okay. which is the new series, you know, they and they right. used a lot of his the ideas of his artwork, yeah, you know, like the posters and the marketing, and they're like, what, uh -huh. what do you think? Is, isn't that cool that they're using your yeah. stuff? He's like, it'd be better if and I got like, paid for it. I can get a cent for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's an interesting... Anyway, it's interesting to see these parallel histories yeah. of uh, different, different forms. Yeah. Was there something else you were going to ask, Marianne? Well... It, did that it, answer your question? No, no, it, it did answer my question. I think, you know, I'm thinking about when I write... I, I, we, we're, as I said, we're not unionized, so I'm free to get paid as little as I want um, without necessarily undercutting other people. Um, I'm, I am, a, I'm a, I am a separately a member of the union as a faculty member at UIC, and um, I've been a union employee for a, a very long time. Actually, my first gig was. I was a teamster uh, back when I was a secretary at the University of Chicago 30 <laughs> years ago. And hey, hey, do not knock the teamsters. They got me three twenty-five no, cents an hour. Jimmy Hoffa, don't. Yeah, yeah, they got me three twenty-five right. cents an hour. Do you know hour. where Jimmy Hoffa is? Yeah. <laughs> it's <a> teamster joke. <laughs> they got me uh, three twenty-five cents an hour raises during the year I worked, nice. there, which made a, a material improvement to my quality yeah. of life. So I'm I am super pro union. Everybody fight for 15, and it really should be 25. So, um, <laughs> so if so, at some point we'll have to get. I, I'd love to actually dig into that on this podcast. Sort of pay for writers and artists and all of that. But um, as I said, I am free to do things uh, cheaply if I want to. And one thing that does happen a lot in the arts are trades. So I wanted to kind of ask about. If that happens in in the audiobook narration world, if that would be possible without contravening the union thing, where I might be a professional writer and I've got a friend who's a professional artist, and we, you know, sort of agree to do some work for each other for free um, as a as a trade, or we collaborate on a project and say, well, if any profits come out, we'll split the profits. Um, I'm trying to think of ways that indie authors might be able to get access to pro quality work 
um, for their audiobooks if their budget just can't stretch to union rates? And maybe there isn't a way, in which case my second- Well, I, that is a question is what, what, how does profit sharing enter into this? I mean, is there a thing where it, do, the, do the union rates allow you to take less upfront and more as a percentage or something like that? I guess it's, it's one question. No, I don't, and as far as I know, not with, I mean, not in, in, in audiobooks. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. there was, there was talk about that a while ago and it was sort of, and maybe, maybe they still do it in certain situations, but I mean, look, there, it, it, it this is an ongoing struggle. The mm -hmm. people who are producing it, the people with behind the money always want to pay the people doing the artistic work less. And if they can, mm -hmm. they will, um, mm -hmm. which, which is why I'm a big proponent of unions as well you yeah. know, for that reason. Um, and once they start to chip away at what you're going to get paid, I mean, Look, I'm I'm not begrudging. I'm very uh, lucky and fortunate to be an audiobook narrator and to get paid what I get paid, and I'm I'm happy with it. And it keeps me, you know, it's 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 all great. But when I do talk, but because the market is, and and I'm I'm thrilled that the audiobook world has exploded so much. It's also been overly saturated now, and now anyone who's like, well, I'm get, I can get in here, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do it independently. I'm not going to do it through the unions. I mean, I talked to friends who mm -hmm. did it years before I started and they're like, you have no idea the money we made. It was mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. more then because it was a smaller market um, right. yeah. and people were willing to pay for it. Um, and now, and that's what, you know, and, and look, the unions are to blame in, in, in some aspect. I mean, this goes throughout all the arts entertainment, you know, um, you know, no one had any idea or, or maybe people did, but like, you know, I know SAG, SAG and after, mm -hmm. you know, didn't expect the internet to blow up in the way yeah. it did, but you know, yeah. now non-union work is cutting into so much of the union work and, and mm -hmm. people, and I, and I get it. Producers, that's their job to figure out mm -hmm. how to cut costs and to pay as little as they can to make as much money as they can. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the times that falls to us and people, you know, expect and, and, and actors, and I would think writers as well, too, in a, in, a, in a sense, because it is such a tough business to get into. It's like, we want to work. We want to work. You know, I mean, I have friends who are in IATSE in the stagehands union. You talk about a strong union. Mm. You know, <laughs> don't fuck with IATSE, you know, um, because yeah. they, they will walk, you know. Yeah. And yeah. they're fighting yeah. for what's right. These guys work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ah, it's it's, it's yeah. insane how much time and effort they put in. Mm -hmm. to the work to mm -hmm. keep Broadway and the shows running. I mean, it's unbelievable. So it's like, pay us what's right. You know, do mm -hmm. you know, do the right thing. So there, there is that. You know, as as actors, and again, I would imagine with writers too. There's 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 this thing of. Um, I was just talking about this with someone the other day, where it's like we always say yeah, we always want to say yes. We don't want to say no. Yeah. You know, because you never know where the next job's going to come from. You know, and my wife's a teacher. Mm -hmm. She doesn't understand that sometimes. She's like, "Well, why yeah. are you doing it?" And I'm like, "Well, because I mm -hmm. I got to keep working because I don't yeah know this yeah could be my last job this right could be, right and then that's it." So you're yeah. always saying yes, and but you but in doing that, you also don't want to under undercut your mm -hmm. value. And, yeah, well, and you're yeah. and you're and you're undercutting everybody else too, right? Exactly. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the problem. So and, and Marianne, I think I think one way that you're framing the question where you're like, well, how can indie writers who don't have that much budget get this done? In a way, if you if it it's your I, I just want to say the framing is a little like this is an ancillary thing that you, that is a component of your book that needs to happen, like a cover or proofreading or it's like, oh, I'm bringing out a book here. But actually, the audiobook is a separate derivative work that is a separate artistic project. It's like project two, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how I mean, this it just the unraveling is yeah. from Erewhon. The, the audiobook is from Podium. They're not. Yeah. Right. They're not the same company. It's not related. Like and so and in a way, it's like it's not on, you know, that you bring out the book and then you figure out what's the budget for this audio book. And like, and then of course you have a choice to make of like what level of quality, like you do with everything. Uh, but, but if you, it, it does seem like if you decide that it's worth the investment of doing it at union rates yeah. and doing it a pro as a pro quality audio book, then you have, you know what the budget is for that. You do a Kickstarter right. for that. Right. It's well, like, we're going to make gonna, the gonna, audio book gonna... of the, yeah, yeah, I was gonna, I was going to bring up Kickstarter because that does actually seem like I've been trying to convince indie authors to do more crowdfunding in advance um, for exactly this kind of reason, because they can then set up stretch goals and they can say, you know, 
I, I want yeah. to publish this book. It's going to be an anthology of South Asian climate change voices, for example, right? Like, let's say that's something I might want to do. I'd run a Kickstarter for that. And I would say it's going to cost, you know, I have to pay the writers. Here's the, the base, like minimal version of it is going to cost $5,000. That's like to get it done and existing in the world as an ebook. And then I can then add on and be like, if you're right. excited about this project, you know, our first stretch goal is we're going to also do an audiobook version and that's going to be X many thousand dollars more. And then, and that, then you know, and then you know how much more yeah. it would be. You know what the word count is. You can estimate yeah. what the finished number of hours would be. So you know what to budget right. for. So it's, you know, and, and if you're an indie author, let's say you're, you know, you're a mom, you've got three kids, you're at home, you're writing some fabulous smut and putting it out for $1.99 Kindle eBooks um, in your spare time. And it's, you know, you don't really have any budget at all up front and, and maybe you're not able to do a Kickstarter right away. Um, I, I still kind of think you should, but you, you could do something like if you do a Kickstarter, you could say, you know, well, a thousand dollars will let me, you know, hire enough babysitters that I can write the book um, and finish or finish writing the book. Maybe it would be more like $5,000, but whatever, like, let's try and keep the costs as low as we can. Um, you know, I, my plan is that I will, you know, record the audiobook myself, but if you guys are excited about this and love it and would like to hear it done by a professional, I'd love that too. And then I have this stretch goal and that would let me hire a professional. One of the things that when I did a, I, my last book was a cookbook, a, a Feast of Serendib, and one of my stretch goals so no audiobooks for the cookbook <laughs> i'm afraid <laughs> um, but uh, there could be i sort of imagine like what would that sound like but anyway putting that aside um but i had stretch goals of things like i'm going to hire a sri lankan artist as an illustrator to add hand-drawn illustrations through the book and i was really excited that we got to get to that stretch goal and i got to add that because it made it a much more beautiful book um so yeah, I guess I was, I don't know, that's that's kind of, I just wanted to put that framing out there for people who are interested in hiring a professional. And then I was going to pivot haha, to, let's say you are that mom and you're just starting out and this is all a little beyond you. Or do you have any tips for, and, and this would actually apply also to just people who are beginners and looking to learn how to be a professional audiobook narrator, maybe. I don't know if they're the same things, but I guess beginners looking to go pro, maybe you tell them to take acting classes. But if you're if you're a mom at home, are there like obvious mistakes that people should should make? Are there like top three things that they should be trying to pay attention to as they're recording this? I'm sorry to focus on moms. I just I happen to know a bunch of moms who are right <laughs> so it's a it's a really like thriving industry right now. So it's not like it's not like the moms can't join the union. But anyway, yes. Yeah. So well, beginners they can, well, they tips for beginners. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tips for so, beginners. How do you, yeah. how, how would you get into this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first thing is you can, I, I, I don't think if you're just a mom or dad or aunt or uncle or whatever, and someone's like, you have a good voice, mm -hmm. go into audiobooks. Because I do, that's, that's my living. That's what I do as a prof. you know, I, I, there, there's, it's sure. like anything, you know, like you have to build up to that, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I want to write, I'm going to publish a book. No, you got to sit down and write yeah. and work on writing yeah. you know and yeah. and work on your craft so i think if it's something you want to do then figure out how to work on that craft just because you have a great voice it mm -hmm. yes you could get lucky if you also have the facility yeah. to tell stories and and be you know uh convey the truth in that way and be a good actor you know yes you could it's happened it happens in hollywood all the time people mm -hmm. just are good looking and they're like you movie star mm -hmm. and it happens <laughs> um, yeah it's very rare but um, yeah. but my first suggestion would be to to work on your craft and anything what it is you know mm -hmm. and and um you know if if it's something if if you're asking the question if someone's already an act if they're doing this if this is something that they're in they're involved in acting they want it they they are already working on that craft and they want to pivot pivot into audiobook <laughs> narration then it's about you know I would say seek out uh you know listen to some audiobooks, get an idea of what the sound, what the sound is, or, I mean, I'll be honest, I'd never listened to audiobooks when I started, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and a lot of people will ask, a lot of actors that I know will say, 
Fred, I want to, I want to, like brilliant actors. They'll say, I want to get into a mm-hmm. voice, I want to do voiceovers or audiobook narration. Yeah. Should I take a class? And a lot of times, and maybe this is wrong, I'll say, you're, you, no, you don't need to. You're a great actor. If you want to do it, mm-hmm. I, my suggestion is always is, if you're going to do it, take a class with someone who is in the, don't just take a class with Joe Schmo who teaches, mm-hmm. you know, audiobook narration. Um, take a class with someone who could actually get you a job, you know, who is mm-hmm. a director or a casting director um, who is in the industry who could hear your voice week after week and say, I'm going to call this person in. To me, that's more beneficial. For someone who is already an established, you know, who's got the craft under their belt. Because a lot Mm -hmm. of it is just technique. It's getting the, working with the mic, you know, knowing, you know, just just bringing things down if you're primarily a stage actor, knowing how to bring it down and make it more intimate for the mic. I always think, and and there's nothing. There's, there's, it's, it's always great to take more classes and to learn more. Um, Mm -hmm. But if you've got that facility already, I think you're going to be able to, you know, if you have a good director, you know, you'll be able to. They'll be able to bring you down to where you need to be for the booth, for the mic, and whatnot. Um, But that being said, yeah, I think seeking out, you know, there's some great uh, audiobook classes and teachers. Paul Rubin, who is, I mentioned, his, his wife, Paula, um, who who uh, directed my first audiobook. Her husband, Paul, is a fantastic, teaches a great audiobook class. Um, I know Peter Burkrot, who's a wonderful narrator and actor. Um, he teaches, you know, he has a great audiobook class. There are people who do that. So it's like seeking out the people who are, who are mm-hmm. working in the industry. Uh, I think that's the best way to do it, uh, just to, to, to give you some insight. And they'll also, you know, hopefully those classes and those people will somehow get you connections in. Because that's, as you guys know, as, you know, writers too, and any, it's just, it's also who you know, you sure. know, and just having the connections. And that's where mm-hmm. I just got lucky, you know, knowing mm-hmm. people and they were nice enough to keep calling me back. So, you know, it's getting that skill set down and feeling good about them and then finding the ways in. And there are different publishers that I know accept uh, reels, you know, getting a reel done mm-hmm. is, it would be important, mm-hmm. you know, getting something that you could send that out to them, say, okay, here's a sample of me reading, yep. you know, a little bit of nonfiction, a little bit of fiction, some character stuff. Uh, those are all ways to, to go about it. I think also, you know, uh, even if you are just planning to read your own books, I, I'm now listening to all of this. I'm thinking, wow, I think I would try to take a class if I could, just so even if I weren't going to try and make a shift into generally professional audiobooks, just just so I had a better sense to know what I'm doing, know what yeah. I, what to watch out for, um, you know. And I know from <laughs> from I'm not very sound sensitive. I guess is one way to put it, right? I'm not an audiophile, and I can listen to, I don't know. You know, I, I have friends who want to listen to records on the original vinyl and they care about the quality of the sound in a way that I can't even hear the difference, right? Mm-hmm. And so another thing I guess I might say is having someone on your team, whether it's a spouse or a friend or whatever, who is good at that and cares and pays attention is um, is going to be really helpful. I know for, for our podcast, if you listen to the early days of our podcast, Darius, our, our sound and video producer, wants to weep sometimes. Be, uh, sorry, <laughs> that may be an exaggeration, but he's quite <laughs> frustrated with quality, the sound quality of the early yeah. days. And when he points it out, I can hear what he's talking about, but I would never have noticed. Um, but there are lots of listeners who will notice, who will well, care. Well, the unsung heroes of the audiobook world are the engineers. You know, yeah. the engineers, mm-hmm. the the you know the the men and the women who are who are and everything in between who are sitting there in the booth. Uh, you know, I mean that that's the thing, and that that's what I miss the most actually about mm-hmm. you know recording at home, but going mm-hmm. into the studio and having someone in there, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. on the journey with me, and they're the ones yeah. who who catch the mistakes and clean up. I mean. You know the whole process. Uh, you know, shout out to Podium because I love working for them. They're just they're they are the, mm-hmm. the the nicest people in the world. I think that's because they're Canadian. Cool. And everyone <laughs> in Canada is, is really nice. But yeah, no, I, I really do. Like I I get so happy when I when I get books from Podium. They're 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 just wonderful and and they're really it's fun material. But you know it's it's um with those with Podium in particular. 
you know, I, I don't do it with a director or engineer on board. I'm doing it all myself, just the narration. Mm -hmm. But then I send it off, um, and they have their wonderful engineers and their proofers who go through, and they listen, and they find the mistakes, and they send me back spreadsheets, you know, sometimes really big spreadsheets of all the little mistakes I made or the things mm -hmm. I need to go back or if there were, you know, noises. You know, they'll send that to the editor. There's a whole team yeah. that that clean it up and make it really sound beautiful. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, can't, that. I can't do that myself. I know there are actors who do everything yeah. themselves, you know, who will do the editing, the proofing. I, I would, that would drive me bonkers. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. This thing, right? Like I, it makes me crazy to read a book with a lot of typos in it. It just, by the third one, I want to scream. And so <laughs> I feel like it must right. be very parallel. And so when yeah. I, when I put a book out, I put as many eyes as I can on the draft to proof it and be like, you know, please, please let's find all the typos. And the first book I did, I think we had four people proofing it and four errors still crept through, ah, you know, so, um, so. I and I do think with these things, even if you don't notice it consciously, even if you're like, oh, well, I'm not the kind of person who can tell, but you unconsciously, it does make a difference. It does make a difference in the, just the feeling of quality. Like, I don't like, like, I don't really get fonts like there are people like there are people like our friend david moles like they really know what font is a good font i have no idea what font is a good font i don't consciously notice but i do notice when you know what i mean if something yeah, is yeah. professionally done and has like after after david moles takes a pass on the poster i'm like oh now that looks real <laughs> yeah, yeah. just that kind of thing where the the sound quality matters best foot yeah. forward all the time yeah. because sometimes you're not going to get a second chance you know you want yeah uh, i have a funny good. font anecdote which is I recently, <laughs> I know, right? Which, and then then we're gonna start wrapping up. But uh, but I recently read something saying that if you write your initial drafts in Comic Sans, it frees you up to have sort of less stress and anxiety when you're drafting. <laughs> so I actually tried that for my most recent story and I think it Did works. It work? I think well, it actually I does think. work. It's like you can't that's, take yourself that's, that's too seriously, funny. right? If yeah, you write yeah. Hands. And then you yeah. Well, that's why I always convert it afterwards. That, I that was I, I. That's why I always try. You know, write in a cheap note notebook rather. If you have a like fancy moleskin, you're like, oh my oh, god, yeah, everything yeah. I write has to be perfect. It's just if some like dollar ninety nine crappy yeah. spiral notebook you're like all right let's get to work anyway that's a little off topic no no um, I don't. so ben so, have any so last wait last questions, questions for yeah. for for fred i was oh, a couple of i did have one question which was we didn't really get to which was is it different by genre like do you feel like the work of doing um uh well i mean one thing i'm interested in which uh we didn't really go into is just how it's different audiobook acting. We talked a little bit about it. I mean, you're everybody for one thing, but like any ways in which it's different from other kinds of acting. And then also among genres, like if science fiction and fantasy books versus mysteries versus I don't know what, I mean, you talked about a little bit of fiction and nonfiction again ob is obvious, but are there subtler differences between different kinds of genres or modes and, and just between that kind of acting and other kinds of acting are the things you particularly like or don't like about it or that are challenging or different I mean, in, in terms of, you know, comparing it to other, you know, uh, modes of acting and, you know, with film or TV or, or, or theater, I mean, it, it's the biggest thing is that you're telling the whole story. You're everyone, mm -hmm. you know, you're from yeah. start to finish. That's the most exciting thing about it and the most daunting thing about it, you know, and you sort of, you're, you're the storyteller, you know, when I'm, mm -hmm. when I go on stage, when I'm doing The Lion King, I am one character, I'm Timon, that's it, I have to tell his story. Uh, yeah. to help support the rest of the story you know yeah. so i'm a cog in that wheel of the story of simba and and whatnot um uh but you know with audiobooks you're you're the one you're you're yeah you've got the whole thing so it's um it's up but it's also fun and as an actor what i what i really love about it is it gets it l lets me play characters that i would never play mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um, yeah you know i get a chance to 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 be cast in roles that I would never ever ever get to yeah. to do you know I said earlier you know I I I am not going to be cast in a television show as a six foot five African American linebacker it's not going right, to happen right. but if I'm doing the Walking Dead novels which I did that was one of the characters and I got to yeah. do that you know um, yeah. I got to inhabit these these voices and these worlds and so you know that that's that's sort of fun to do, uh, and, and it's 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 a great challenge, but it's a, it's a great joy 
to do that. Um, you know, in terms from genre, it, it the, yeah, there's definitely there can be a shift, but you also have to be careful because, you know, in my head I heard sci-fi and I immediately went to dystopian dark. You know, uh-huh, right, right, it and that's it's not that. So it really depends yeah. on the book. The other another big series that I do um, for Podium, uh, Lindsay Brewer. Uh, Broker's books. I just pronounced her name wrong. I, and I apologize. Um, those are sci-fi novels, uh, but it's the same thing. They're very fun. It's really more about mm-hmm. the, the the scientists and sort of like the, the you know the geeks in space. I like to yeah. say, you know, the the, the yeah. you know, it's not really. There are a couple of cool space battles, but it's really about you know the smart mm-hmm. nebbishy scientists who are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. we got to do it this way. Um, right. So it's, it's a different. It's a different feel, so it it yeah. really depends. It depends on the book, and how it's written. Because, uh, yeah, you get a feel when when I get a book that's a genre, you know, that's in this or like I know this is noir or this is you know this looks more like mm-hmm. rom commy by the cover or this is yep. w- whatever it is. You get a feel, and you're like, oh, I think this mm-hmm. is what it's going to be. But you never know until you read it. It could be completely yeah, different. yeah, so sure. It's always that's sure. always a pleasant surprise. All right, we we have kept cool. Fred a long time, so we're gonna we're gonna start wrapping. Um, I wanted to ask Fred, um, what would you point readers to? What you know, work that you've particularly are proud of? I mean, I know you won two Audi Awards. Maybe you could tell people what those were for, and uh, maybe whatever recent thing you'd like to promote. Sure. Um, yeah, they were. Uh, God, I don't even remember what they were for, but they, I guess they were good. Uh, um, I mean, I mentioned, I, well, I mentioned that Charlie Kaufman book, Ant Kind. Um, mm-hmm. I was really proud of that. That was great. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, again, it's, it's a commitment. If you're not into them, mm-hmm. you're not gonna, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but I, I, I loved working on that. And my director, Simone Barros was just unbelievable it was so you know that that's a pretty great one but again that's uh you know if you're if you're familiar with charlie kaufman he can go he can yeah. go into some pretty strange <laughs> strange right. places um gosh i'm i'm trying to think uh well we should we should go see you on broadway in the lion king so yeah, I'll just... you can come see that <laughs> if you're if you're in the dc area i was mentioning during one of our breaks i'm i'm Directing my my uh, one of my very dear friends, uh, Lisa Stephen Friday, wrote a one woman show about her experience as a trans woman, and we played in a band together for years. Lisa Jackson and Girl Friday. So um, the live we did a virtual production of that over the break, which was very successful and got really some really nice reviews and did well. So now we're finally doing it. Now that audiences are coming back, we're doing a live version of that, and that's running. I don't know when this is going to air, but that's running in DC. Uh, from January 27th through the end of February, so um, cool. We're pretty uh, pretty excited about that. Um, oh, I think we're going to air this pretty soon because oh, okay. I believe the audiobook of the unraveling is when is it coming out, Ben? January 25th, so just perfect for yeah. for that time frame. We should we should try and get this out before then so that yeah. we can and people of course, can go to the get, unraveling. That's a great yeah. Too. Get the that's, unraveling yeah, on the uh, audiobook, yeah. and then go see the one woman show in DC. Yeah, our, our, our audio engineer is going to going to. Um, I you know, I suspect the they fare well. Get this done quickly. So yeah, um, yeah, I think that would be great. The the most recent Audi winner, he's telling me in chat, is the only plane in the sky. Oh, the only plane in the sky. Oh yeah, that was a that was a great one. That's a um, that was I mentioned my friend Scott Sherritt before the great director. He directed that, and that's uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 and uh, retelling from different voices of of nine eleven. Uh, uh, that was one of the many. Wow. That was a multicast, and okay. that was a great one. And I think the year before, I I was involved in a book called Daisy Jones and the Six, uh, by Jennifer Egan, I believe is her name, and it's that yeah, one it as well for familiar. multicast. It's uh-huh. a great book. I loved uh. it. It's really really good. Um, there was a book called Sadie that we won for. Um, I can't remember this. Lot. We're gonna, we're gonna, like, we'll link to your bio, so don't yeah, worry. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have a link. <laughs> we'll have, we'll have tons of links. So uh, thank you so much, Fred. This has been, um, for me at least, I, I, you know, I, we know Mary Robinette Kowal, who is a, um, a writer in the field, a professional puppeteer, professional audiobook uh, narrator, and I've talked to her a little bit about this, but I've 
a chance to really go in depth. And so it's, it's really enlightening. Um, I, I feel like I've learned a lot. It's like a little class. So, uh, <laughs> so that's been. Yeah, thanks great. so much. Well, and thank thanks you. for narrating the unraveling. That thank was you a... for letting me narrate you know, the, the unraveling. <laughs> thank you for all your notes, so I could figure out my way into it. So, no, it, was, it was it was great. That was a lot. Of, it was it was daunting, but in the best way. It was a lot of fun. So, where do we yeah. find you? I'm excited um, for people to hear it. Where do we find you on social media? And if someone wants to hire you, who do they talk to? Uh, you can find me, I think, on the, on Instagram, and I don't. I'm not really much on Twitter, but I am there. You can. I'm, I'm at the Fred Berman. Um, oh, I should also plug, I have my own podcast called Opening Weekend, which nice. is uh, a lot of fun. Me and my two best friends talking about movies and nostalgia, and uh, it's great. So you can check that out, openingweekendpodcast.com. Uh, Fredberman.net is my website. Um, uh, and those are all the ways that you can. Yeah. And so if people want to hire, if people want to hire you, the info's on the website. It should all be there. Yeah. Fredberman.net. I couldn't get .com. Someone else got that. If you can. You know, <laughs> I, have, I have my name.com, but I really wanted just my last name. And there's this guy in India who asked me for $5,000 for it. And it would be a bargain now, but this was you know, 25 years ago, and I was a starving grad student, and I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, you're American. I'm like, I am a starving grad student. I live on ramen. I do not have $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe ask again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So, all right. Thanks so much, Fred. It's been just terrific having you on the show. Thank you.